Hi, my name is Zoe Blade and I'd like to show you a little bit about how a synthesizer works, which is this one behind me. Uh, this particular one is a modular synthesizer, uh, but I think in some ways it might actually make things easier to explain because you can actually see everything. Uh, you can see where all the connections are made rather than that being abstracted and hidden from you. So uh, let's, let's dive right in. Things falling out already. Let's hope that's not a problem. So first of all, we need a way to enter notes. Uh, what I've got here is a 16-step sequencer uh, that happened to be uh, designed and built by my partner Nina, who's very lovely. And for the most part, I think today, uh, we're going to just be using it as a keyboard. You see it's got a little keyboard there that works just the same as a regular keyboard, so we can be in doing notes that way. So let's uh, get some wires hooked up. So uh, this has a CV note output, uh, which outputs the pitch of the note, so the frequency of it. Let's output the pitch of the note into the oscillator's uh, CV input. Oh, I've already got stuff hooked up, that's no good. Okay. So as probably some of you know by now, uh, sound is just, uh, for our purposes, uh, a speaker moving backwards and forwards between 20 and 20,000 times a second. And that moves your eardrum backwards and forwards 20 to 20,000 times a second. And the faster it moves backwards and forwards, the higher the pitch of the note. So all this is doing is telling this uh, how fast to move backwards and forwards. And we can then take one of the outputs of the oscillator and plug it into this and all this does is it's basically a volume control and it turns the volume up and down. Uh, for safety reasons I always go through that module and I, I don't now put the oscillator straight into uh, the, the rest of the gear. And then we can take the output of the volume control and put that into the actual uh, output the, the general output of the uh, synthesizer, uh, the inputs of basically the sound card in the computer. So let's turn the volume up. And we can hear it's not playing any notes in particular. <laughs> right, now that we're actually entering notes, the oscillator is playing whichever note you enter. Just probably slightly out of tune because I haven't tuned it, but for purposes that's good enough, I think. Right, now the first thing you need to know about oscillators is that they're always oscillating. Uh, they never stop at the end of the note. They don't know that a note started or stopped. Uh, they just always oscillate. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the gate, which is just another uh, control voltage. You don't even need to know anything about volts. Volts are basically, for our purposes, they're just numbers. So this is usually off, it's just a zero. And when you press a note, it goes on, so it's a one. So we can take the uh, note being on or off, we can take that output, feed it to the input of the volume. So what we've effectively done here is automated the volume. It's going to automatically go on when we enter a note and go off again when we let go of the note. So now it's starting to sound like an actual musical instrument. <laughs> Vaguely. Now at the moment it's kind of like an organ in that the, the volume's either completely on or completely off, which is kind of boring. As the same note doesn't have much interest. The first thing we'll probably want to do is make the volume of the note change over time so it slowly decays like a, a real uh, acoustic instrument would. So for that we can use, uh, first of all we can use just a simple decay. That's the simplest way of doing that, so let's try that first. So instead of going directly from the, uh, the note being on or off into the volume, what we can do is we can make that trigger a decay and we can make the decay change the volume so that the volume decays. So let's try that. And I've done something wrong. Oh yeah, that's an input, not an output. Let's try that again. There we go. So now the, the volume changes throughout the note. A bit more like, say, a harpsichord. And you can change how long it takes to decay. In 
in a very loose sense of the phrase, you could say it sounds a bit like a guitar now, although obviously it kind of doesn't. So that's okay for plucky type sounds, but we want to get a bit more advanced than that. So let's use the fairly standard by this point uh, envelope generator. It's not just a decay, it's an attack, decay, sustain and release. So let's look at how that works. Uh, let's see, this goes back to the gate. This goes to the envelope output. Okay, so first of all, uh, with the attack decay and release off and the sustain all the way up, it's just like it was at the beginning when it was like an organ. So what this is doing is saying it instantly gets to the loudest volume, instantly phase back down to the sustain amount, but because you've got that set to the maximum, that really has no effect. And when you let go of the note, it instantly phase to nothing. So it's just like if we were directly uh, connecting the gate uh, to the, uh, the the volume. So that's with those settings, it sounds just like an organ. So if you want to do the decay type setting, we can do that instead. We can turn the sustain all the way down. And we can turn the decay up a bit. Although if you let go of the note halfway through, it instantly goes off just like with the gate. Now the release controls how long it takes to fade to silence once you let go of the notes, you need to move that up as well. But this can do so much more. Uh, you can make it, for instance, if you go back to the, uh, the organ type sound, let's see, like this. Okay, if we slowly turn up the attack and release, we can make it uh, slow to rise and then uh, stay at the maximum volume as it did before, but then slow to decay, or slow to release rather, slow to go back to silence. That's nice for slow pad sounds and when it comes to anything like a you know, choir, strings, for anything slow and harmonious where you're kind of uh, accentuating the chords rather than melodies, uh, that can be a nice way of doing it, especially polyphonically, it sounds quite nice. So that's uh, quite a nice, uh, it's not really a sound, is it? it's, more, it's more how the volume changes. It's quite a nice changing of volume for a note to have. But you can do more things with it. Uh, say you set the sustain to about, say, the middle part. <laughs> right, we can change how long it takes to go from the highest volume to the volume it's going to stay at until we let go of the note. This probably makes more sense with the attack off, so let's change that down to the lowest setting. What I like to do is have the attack and uh, sustain off, but have the decay up a bit and the release down a bit. So it's like if you're, uh, say, playing a, a piano or a guitar, uh, while you're playing the note, it's still decaying, but quite slowly. And then when you let go, it decays much, much quicker. So really, uh, the ADSR envelope generator is quite versatile. Uh, it can do your like fully on them, fully off shapes, just like a gate. It can do your decays, just like the decay module on its own can do. Uh, but it can also do a whole bunch of things besides, like uh, is it trapezoid or rhombus, is it, whatever that shape is, <laughs> it can do that one. Uh, all of which are available as separate modules. Um, but it can also do a whole bunch of things that they can't chiefly, uh, you know, more kind of realistic piano and guitar type sounds as far as the volume changing over time is concerned. So that's what you can do with an envelope generator. Uh, you can also get voltage controlled envelope generators, so you can make uh, any uh, input you give it uh, affect uh, any of these settings. So if you wanted, say, uh, louder notes to take longer to decay, uh, I use this for that, which has a CV input. Uh, for the decay length and if you wanted to say have the uh, volume of the note affect 
how long it takes to attack. You, you can get ones that do that. Uh, personally, I haven't really found much use. Uh, I, I don't have one of those. This is just, you, you set it manually, you can't automate it. Uh, but you can get those if you uh, want to explore that kind of thing. So now let's take a closer look at what the oscillator itself can do. This is the bit that makes the initial sound. Uh, at the moment, it's just playing a note, uh, just making a single vibration in effect. Uh, we can change the footing or uh, octave of it. Okay, that is not stable. Okay, I'm going to try a different cable. This is the joys of analog right here. Okay, so we can change the footing or octave of the sound. Which I think is kind of a fun thing in its own right. You can specify in the notation which octave a particular melody is in, but you can override it uh, when you're patching and performing. And sometimes uh, I get a little bit bored and what I like to do is just change the octave that a given melody is in halfway through the piece of music for no real reason, just to add a bit of variety. And I think it's little things like that that really kind of add up to make the, the music sound a bit more weird and interesting, so I like that. <laughs> Now, uh, if you look here, you can see there's uh, four different uh, shapes of vibration it can output to the speaker. So, so far we've been doing sawtooth. And hopefully I'm going to be able to show you on an oscilloscope what that looks like. It literally looks like a sawtooth. Which will either go like that, so it's straight up and then diagonally down, or it goes diagonally up and then straight down. Then there's a triangle, which just does a uh, equilateral triangle. Uh, there's a sine wave, which makes a squiggly shape, which is, I think, the simplest shape there is as far as physics generally seems to be concerned. For a very pure sound. And then there's the pulse wave, which usually makes a square wave but you can change the width of it. So instead of uh, making a square wave, you can make it do a, a very thin one, then a very thick one, or a very thick one, then a very thin one, which will sound the same, by the way, because our ears can't tell which way up a sound is. Uh, when I say the speaker moves back and forth, it changes the pressure in air. So it'll either be moving your ear drum one way or the other way, either backwards or forwards, but your ear can't differentiate between it going backwards like say three quarters of the time and then forwards like one quarter or backwards one quarter and then forwards three quarters which I thought was kind of interesting but we, we just can't differentiate those sounds. We can tell that it's being moved backwards and forwards uh, spending three quarters of the time in one direction and one quarter in the other but we can't tell which way around it is. So we can change uh, the square wave. If I just uh, go back a second to making this sustained it'll be a bit easier to hear. Okay, so here's a square wave. And if we make it, say, three quarters uh, going in one direction, one quarter of the time it spins in another direction. Sounds a bit more nasal. But if we do it in the other direction, sounds the same. But the fun part of synthesizers is you can slowly sweep from one to the other. So let's try it. Now you may have noticed though that it went silent for a bit because I think it was spending 100% of the time in one direction which is generally quite bad and you don't want to do that. Um, when it comes to moving speakers backwards and forwards, uh, if you want to hold them in one place you best hold them in the resting position. You don't really want to move them to one side and keep them there. That's a bad idea. Uh, that's the kind of way that you might blow up speakers so don't do that. So you've got to be very careful with stuff like this. 
So it's actually one of the reasons I prefer Don't Prefer's uh, analog noise generator to his digital noise generator. Uh, the analog one moves the speaker randomly in every direction, but the digital one, because it's outputting either ones or zeros, uh, it's only moving it in one direction, not the other direction. So it'll be moving the speaker and hence your ears forwards through to resting, but never backwards. And as a result of that, uh, it does not sit well in the mix, you, you should not do that. So yeah, digital things outputting ones and zeros are generally, uh, they're called unipolar because only go in one direction, unipolar, uh, as opposed to bipolar which goes in both directions. Uh, and you're really not supposed to hear unipolar things, it's generally uh, a bad idea. Which is why I prefer the analog noise generator that Dopa makes, which is this one here. Uh, let's see. Now we can automate uh, changing the pulse width, which is fun. We've got this thing here called uh, an LFO. Uh, we've got another one here. Uh, for our purposes right now, they're basically the same. And what we can do is we can take the output of this, say a, a nice triangle wave, just like the one we heard, only much slower. You can actually see it going backwards and forwards there. Right, we can take the output of that and turn that into the input of what is calling PCV. Usually this is called uh, PWM, pulse width modulation. Uh, this is a pulse width, that's, it's the pulse width control voltage, I guess. The, that, that's not the, the clearest labeling. That this is the feeding uh, a voltage output from a triangle wave that's really slow to the input here of the pulse width. And all we're doing is we're going to automate uh, doing that so when we were changing the width of the pulse, this is doing that for us automatically at that speed. And we can change how much it's doing that. So we can make it do it a little bit, or we can make it do it a lot. And here we can change the speed of the triangle wave, so we can change the speed it's doing it at. Let's make that a bit clearer. So you can slow it right down. And you can see that while listening. We can speed it up. Now you may notice it sounds like it's doing it twice as fast as it looks like it's doing it. And that again is because your ear can't tell the difference between it being really thick and thin in one end versus thick and thin the other end. So that's why it sounds like it's twice as fast as it looks. So your ear can tell when uh, this is kind of resting in its middle position, but it can't differentiate between this LED being as bright as possible when uh, the other foes all at one end versus the LED being as dim as possible when the other foes at the other end in terms of uh, pulse width at least. And this sounds a lot better when we're making bass lines, I think. I'm pretty sure when, when I was uh, playing a game called Nightbreed in the Commodore 64 and it made sounds like that, that was when I you know, really first loved the sound of synthesis, realising it could make sounds like this. So that's pulse width modulation. Uh, those are all the kind of basic sounds you can make with an oscillator. And a lot of the time when synthesizers sound more interesting than that, it's because of filters which take parts of the sound and then remove them in interesting ways. But as you, you're starting basic building block, that's uh, what synthesizers sound like at the start of the journey of the sound. So that's uh, the first kind of, I would like to think of it in terms of sculpting. This is the raw clay that it's then sculpting out of. Uh, there's also noise, which this thing makes. We can have a listen to that. Uh, so instead of outputting from the oscillator, we'll get the white noise from the noise generator. And just like the oscillator, this is always generating noise regardless of what else you're doing. It's just always generating noise on the off chance you're going to listen to it at any given time. So if we output the white noise into the, uh, the VCA, the, the, the automatic volume knob, then we get this. 
and we can change the color of the white noise but really all that's doing is filtering so it's usually best done uh, with one of these filters instead this it does other things too which i'm grateful for but i think that's beyond uh, the scope of what i'm going to show you today now as this is a modular synthesizer uh, you can connect things in any way you want so instead of using say uh, the adsr envelope generator a tactically sustained release envelope generator uh, to change the volume over time. Uh, let's see, it would help if I had something plugged in. Right, let's go back to the sawtooth wave. Right, so instead of having the ADSR uh, changing the volume over time, what we could do is we could have the LFO changing the volume over time. And you can make interesting sounds that way. And you notice that if you change the volume of a sound really quickly, uh, it goes so quickly that we're basically changing uh, the speaker position because it's that quick. Once it goes over 20 times a second, it starts to be something that we perceive as sound itself. And you're basically adding another pitch. Now that's something I find kind of interesting and almost magical about synthesis. If you change any aspect of a sound faster than 20 times a second, technically more often than 20 times a second, um, then you perceive that change as being another pitch in its own right. So if you change the volume faster than 20 times a second, uh, the speed you change the volume at is a pitch. If you change the uh, cutoff position of the filter, which we'll get to some other time, uh, that will also be perceived by the ear as a pitch. You can change anything faster than 20 times a second and you're going to perceive it as pitch. Uh, for instance, if you uh, hear someone clapping, that's just uh, a noise, that's a one-off event. If you were to clap faster than 20 times a second, you would actually start to hear that as being a pitch. In fact, we could take some uh, white noise and show you with that. So instead of a uh, sawtooth wave, let's have white noise. This would be, it would sound a bit more like a, a clap, not really that much. Uh, let's see. If we, okay, yeah, let's try this. I'm curious myself now. Let's change this to a sawtooth wave. So we've got a noise, and that doesn't sound like it has a pitch, but if we change the volume of it faster than 20 times a second, that's going to sound like a pitch. Sort of, at least. <laughs> So the sound of an insect flapping their wings once will come off as a noise, but they do it lots of times and it sounds like a pitch. The faster they flap, the higher the pitch. It's the same kind of thing. Now you notice I've got two oscillators, so we can get both of these to play their note at the same time, which can sound interesting. So if we just go back to this patch. And and the maybe so goes in here. Okay. Oh yeah, there's something I forgot to mention earlier, which I should probably mention now. Right. So the sawtooth wave uh, 
let's see. If you look at this on a spectrogram, uh, what that can do is it can turn all of uh, the sounds that you're listening to into a bunch of sine waves. So when you're listening to a single note, you're arguably listening to or can think about what you're listening to in terms of uh, being a bunch of different sine waves. So if you listen to a sine wave, you're listening to one sine wave. That's just a very pure sound. If you're listening to a triangle wave, you're listening to effectively several sine waves at the same time. It's got what are called harmonics. So say uh, you're playing a note, uh, if you pick uh, A, that's going to be 440 hertz or double that or half that, depending on the octave. So you're gonna be listening to the uh, same sounds, in this case, uh, a triangle wave, 440 times every second. But looking at it in terms of sine waves, it's the equivalent of listening to a sine wave at 440 times a second. Also, uh, a, another sine wave that's much faster than that, another sine wave that's much faster than that. Uh, if you listen to a square wave, it's got even more of them. And if you listen to a sawtooth, it's got the most of them. Yeah, that sounds richer. It's because in terms of looking at the sound on the graph, in terms of being converted into a bunch of sine waves, it's got more of them in them. And it's not just like a random amount, it's actually uh, quite a specific mathematical formula. If you play the A just above middle C, then you're hearing that sound repeat 440 times a second. If that's a sine wave, then you're listening to a sine wave repeat 440 times every second. Now with a sawtooth wave, uh, you could say you're listening to the sawtooth wave 440 times a second, but another way of saying the same thing, and this is really interesting I think, is that you're listening to a sine wave 440 times every second, and you're also listening to another sine wave at half the volume at twice the speed. So you're listening to a fainter sine wave at 880 times every second, and one that's even fainter at three times the speed, and another one at four times, another one at five times, and each time it's I think half the volume of the previous one. I could be slightly out of the mass there, but it's a very simple formula to make a sawtooth wave using lots of different sine waves of different frequencies, uh, which is to say speed, and different amplitudes, which is to say volume. So you can make a, a sawtooth wave using nothing but lots and lots of sine waves. And the same is true of triangle waves, except I think you only hear uh, odds numbered harmonics. So you hear the original one, one three times the speed, one five times the speed, but never like the odd num never the even ones, just the odd ones. And that's with a pulse wave or a triangle wave, but with a triangle wave it tapers off quicker because instead of being slightly quieter each time, it's a lot quieter each time, like the square root instead of half. And I could be wrong about the actual mass, I'll probably put something up at the top there in post-production, but it's very simple formulas to work out uh, how to make up any of these shapes using nothing but sine waves. And that's a weird quirk of maths and physics, and I don't know why it is that way, but it's some kind of interesting thing in its own right. And it applies to drawing as well as listening. If you want to draw uh, any of these shapes, you can draw them using a bunch of sine waves all at the same time, uh, affecting, say, an arm. And, and then it will draw it at that particular speed. It will make that particular shape you want. It is really quite an interesting thing in its own right for maths fans. But when it comes to playing a synthesizer and patching it, you don't need to know any of that. You just need to know it can make four basic interesting shapes plus noise, and that's all you need to know. But the other stuff is there uh, if you are interested in that kind of thing. And, and adding up a bunch of sine waves of uh, different speeds and different volumes is known as additive synthesis because you're adding together a bunch of different sine waves. And that's a whole other type of synthesis in its own right. What we're doing here is more subtractive synthesis in that we start off with something that's quite rich in terms of having lots of different sine waves in it, such as a sawtooth wave, and then we take away some of those frequencies uh, using a filter. 
but later on when you're wondering what filters are doing and they're filtering out certain sounds what that means is they're taking out some of the sine waves so in terms of looking at things on a, um, a spectrogram you, you can see that these shapes have different amounts of things in them different amounts of frequencies in them different harmonics, different overtones, basically different sine waves that are at multiples of the original speed. Uh, the thing about them being multiples of the original is that they sound like they're in tune. That's why they're all multiples. If they weren't multiples of the, uh, the original lowest frequency, the fundamental frequency, then they'd sound like a different note that's out of tune with the first one. And if you're into music theory and you look at how chords work, it's very similar. Uh, originally chords would be, say, one note being exactly twice the frequency of the first one, that's being an octave up, being, say, exactly uh, one and a half times the frequency of the first one. Uh, I believe that's a perfect fifth. And you have all these very simple fractions to say what the intervals are that used to be. Uh, how you would have, uh, how you would play pleasing sounding combinations of notes, chords. Uh, but what's happened these days is we kind of made something that sounds a little bit out of tune called 12 tone equal temperament because it has interesting benefits. It's a good trade off because you can do a whole bunch of things that you can't do without 12 tone equal temperament, such as changing key without retuning your instrument in the middle of the song. So being able to do that is one of the benefits. So this is one oscillator. Uh, let's bring on a second oscillator so we can hear two at the same time. So here's uh, the sawtooth coming out of one. And instead, we can output the mixer, get that into the VCA. And we can get the, actually let's use a smaller cable. We can get the sawtooth wave into the mixer. So it sounds the same as before. And we can also add the sawtooth wave of this other oscillator and get that in the mixer too. And you hear how it sounds like it's repeating quite quickly. That's how they're not quite playing the exact same note. They're slightly out of tune compared to each other. And the closer to in tune you get them compared to each other, uh, the slower that sound. So they're almost in tune with each other now. Or you can make them go really out of tune. And again, it's probably more fun if we go down an octave. There we go. So that's two sawtooth waves you're listening to at the same time. Now you can have the two oscillators playing at a different octave to each other. And already it's kind of getting into the realms where you might start to have fun. <laughs> but there's more. Um, this is just listening to two oscillators at the same time, but instead we can have the oscillators affect each other in different ways. Uh, remember when we changed the volume really quickly? Okay, we can use this oscillator to change the volume, for instance. Now, This involves uh, more maths, but when you change the volume fast enough to hear it, uh, you get a whole bunch of weird things happening that you don't want, which the ring mod can do basically the same thing, only without the unwanted bits. So that's a better way of doing the same thing, in effect. So instead of adding these waveforms together, what we do is pop them in the ring mod, which basically multiplies them together instead, in terms of the maths involved, and we get this. Now where it starts to get interesting uh, is if one of these, uh, you actually sweep the uh, pitch. 
So if we just listen to anyone for now. There's no one. Something interesting happening on that note already. Okay, so if we sweep the pitch one of these. Okay, let's backtrack a little bit. Okay, so let's listen to just this oscillator again a second. Right, there's a second CV input here that you can use to modify the pitch. So this is the overall pitch, but this is how you're changing it. So uh, we've got the gate output here. We can send this into multiples, so we can send it to two different things at once. So we can send it to the gate as before. But now we can also send the note on note off information somewhere else. So at the same time, we can put it into the decay that we had before. And we can use that to change the pitch of the uh, oscillator. Maybe not quite that much. Uh, if you've seen my previous videos, you may recognize this is a good way of making kick drums. Make it a bit quicker. That, that starts to sound like a kick drum. Anyway, uh, that's not what we're doing now though, so. <laughs> Right, so now that we've done that, we can take that output and we can put it back in the ring mod. So we go from the oscillator to the ring mod and this other oscillator we could just have going straight in there. Uh, let's find another black one. And we can start to make weird interesting sounds. We can do a similar thing by uh, taking the second oscillator. So if we just go back to one oscillator a second. Uh, so this one oscillator, we just listen to this one oscillator. Okay, we can use a second oscillator. Actually, no, we only listen to just this one that we hear. So. Okay, so now we're just listening to this one oscillator. And what we can do is we can get this second oscillator. What am I doing that one? No, we want this one. Right. Okay, so we're just listening to this one oscillator. Let's turn it up an octave. Okay. And what we can do now is we can uh, see, we can change the pitch like before, but now we're changing the pitch itself with this other oscillator. So it's changing the pitch at a um, audible frequency. So it's faster than 20 hertz, so it's gonna to sound to us like it's doing weird things. which doesn't sound that musically useful yet, but bear with me. <laughs> uh, let's see. We can then sweep uh, the pitch of this oscillator. So we get the decay to change uh, the pitch of this one. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Right, so this is going to sweep the pitch of this one. And I'll just play it directly to show you. Okay, so we can use this, uh, we can feed the output of that, let's feed the sine wave output of that into the input of this other oscillator. So what we're going to do is we're going to listen to a simple sine wave generated by this oscillator, first of all. Uh, 
Right. So that's the pitch of the note as a sine wave. And this oscillator as a sine wave is sweeping. And what we're going to do with this sine wave is use that to change the sound of this first one. So basically what we've got is vibrato happening really, really quickly. And we can change the, uh, the speed that this uh, changes pitch at and the amount it does. Now you can do a whole bunch of things here, such as uh, change how much this is affecting the pitch of this. So this is how much that's this is how much the pitch of this oscillator is being influenced by this other oscillator. So you've got a normal sine wave here, because it's not being influenced by this one at all. But as we let it be influenced more and more, it changes the sound. More and more. And you can automate using other modules how much this is influencing this. And this is the basis of FM synthesis. Uh, what we're doing here, instead of uh, modulating the amplitude, as in AM modulation, uh, we're modulating the frequency, as in frequency modulation. Uh, one audible frequency is affecting the other audible frequency. So more than 20 times a second, you're changing the pitch. Basically, FM synthesis, like in all of the Yamaha DX synthesizers that were so popular in the 80s, is basically extreme vibrato. Uh, they're just changing the pitch more than 20 times a second. So if a singer could sing with a vibrato that changed their voice more than 20 times a second, that singer would be achieving FM synthesis. It's just not humanly possible. You, you need uh, something as, as artificial as this to make those kinds of sounds. But FM synthesis is much better done uh, digitally uh, because you can keep the oscillators in perfect sync with one another and in order to make really nice sounding FM patches you need a lot of oscillators and they can be very simple because all they need to do is make a sine wave but you need to have a lot of them. So that's perfect for digital, and it's one of the things that uh, digital synthesis is much better at than analog synthesis, having lots and lots of oscillators that make just a sine wave that are all in sync with each other. So that's one thing that digital synthesis does a lot better than analog synthesis, is FM synthesis. Uh, but when it comes to subtractive synthesis, um, analog usually sounds more interesting, uh, because the filters are going to uh, be really kind of imperfect sounding. Uh, the oscillators are going to be slightly out of tune. So th when you have lots, you can you know, have them uh, rub off each other the wrong way, which sounds really interesting. And there's going to be a, a whole bunch of slight imperfections that make it sound more interesting. But this is probably a good place to stop for now. Uh, filters are really a whole thing in their own right. But... Uh, as a, a rough kind of guide, uh, this is the, the kind of basic starting point of most synthesizer sounds. Um, but one other thing I didn't show was actual regular vibrato, so let's do that really quickly. So, sine wave, LFO, with a triangle output affecting the pitch. Which is basically all you need. Uh, let's make it a sawtooth instead.
So if you want a, a fairly realistic vibrato, it might be a bit like this for a violin. That's not very realistic, admittedly, but <laughs> uh, you need to get the frequency of the vibrato just right and the amount of uh, how much it's affecting it. And you want to slowly fade it in, so you need another ADSR envelope generator with a slow attack and uh, another one of these volume controls that you're using to affect the volume of the vibrato over time. It starts to get a, a big messy patch, but hopefully you can see from this that even a patch as complicated as that is built up from very simple building blocks. Modular synthesis is basically the Lego of making sounds. You have all these building blocks that each in their own right is fairly straightforward, uh, make a shape, make a shape quicker, make a noise, change the volume, uh, make a, a one-off shape pair note, make another one-off shape pair note, actually play the note. Um, with just that handful of modules you can make quite a, a wide variety of interesting sounds just by working out different ways of connecting them together. And when it comes to a hardwired synthesizer, uh, you can do most of the same things, but because all of these blocks are connected to each other in a certain specific way, uh, you don't have anywhere near the variety you have here. So, for instance, with most hardwired synthesizers, you won't really be able to do much in the realms of FM synthesis. Although, as I say, analog synths aren't really that well suited to it anyway, so it's not the, the biggest loss. Uh, they probably wouldn't be able to do ring mods, which is fancy AM synthesis. So, you know, hopefully if you think, oh, I might want to get into synthesizers, you can see that, okay, it takes a short while to, to learn your way around one, but once you do, it's built up of lots of simple things, most of which are making shapes, and you're hooking up the output of one shape to the input of something else. And that's really, I'd say, all there is to it. You just can do a lot with just that if, if you build it up enough and make it complex enough. Uh, you can also get software modular synthesizers. Uh, native Instruments make them, Autoria make them, a bunch of others. So, um, especially with Autoria's uh, Moog modular, it's very similar to this in terms of how it works. Uh, Korg make an MS20 plugin, which is semi-modular, so it's kind of got, a, by default, it's hardwired behind the scenes as a certain order to all the stuff, but you can override it, because it's got a bunch of these jacks, and little virtual ones on the screen. Um, so yeah, if you are interested in, uh, in synthesis, yeah, I recommend you give it a go, because yeah, it takes a short while to... Uh, you know, learn all the, the ins and outs. But at the end of the day, there's no reason to be intimidated because you are just hooking up shapes to other shape generators. So this shape will affect that shape in this way. And once you get your head around that, it shouldn't be too difficult to pick up any particular new module you learn if you learn one at a time. So that's a few things you can do with a synthesizer, be it modular or not.